Ann Bocock, and welcome to Between the Covers. It's no secret, Alice Hoffman happens to be one of my favorite authors. I could list a dozen titles right off the top of my head, including The Dove Keepers, The Marriage of Opposites. Here on Earth, Alice Hoffman has written more than 30 works of fiction, but there's something about her work when she writes about magic that is just captivating. And after 25 years, after she first released Practical Magic, comes her new book, Magic Lessons. Alice Hoffman, welcome. Thank you so much. It's great to see you. Magic Lessons is the prequel to Practical Magic. Now, for those three people that didn't read Practical Magic, it was a bestseller and a blockbuster film with Nicole Kidman and Sandra Bullock. So did you always know there would be this book? I mean, was this a book 25 years in the making? <laughs> no, I, if I had known, I would have made an outline and notes. But, I, you know, I, this is the third magic book I've written. And I had no idea I was going to keep writing about this family, the Owens family. I really did it because readers wrote to me and said, I think there's more to the story. And there, there was more to the story, as I found out. People who are viewing now... On Facebook, you can drop in your questions and we will get to them as we can a little later on in the show. The book takes place in the 1600s. Now, Maria Owens is by birth a witch. If it's an Alice Hoffman book, what else is she going to be? So to start, if you could read the first two paragraphs of the foreword, and it's where it starts, Dear Reader, because I think think this will tell us why this book was written. Of course. Dear reader, long ago, in a time when witchery was outlawed and women were quickly judged to be dangerous creatures if they talked too much or read books or did their best to protect themselves, stories were told so that we would never forget the past. This was a dark period of history when anyone could give witness against you. They could say that you flew over the fields at night or visited men in their dreams. They could swear that you summoned angels and demons, birds and bears, and could make someone fall in love with you by casting a spell. This is the time when Maria Owens, the first in a long line of women with a bloodline of magic comes of age. First, as an abandoned child in England, then as a young girl on the island of Curacao, and finally as a woman in Salem, Massachusetts, and in Manhattan. Maria's story of a woman alone with a child making her way in a dangerous world is both magical and practical, but her path echoes the struggles of many of us. You don't have to be a witch to know what it's like to be an outcast. And you don't have to have magical powers to be willing to do anything for your daughter. And I was hooked when I read that in the beginning of the book. Thank you. And you did that beautifully. Hannah Owens, we start with Hannah Owens and she raised Maria. Now I wrote down a quote attributed to her where she says, true magic is the making and unmaking of the world with paper and ink. Then I thought about that for a minute. Now for me, books have always been magic. Are for you words the magic elixir? Oh, absolutely. And as I was doing my research into magic, I found out that in England in the 17th century, something like 97% of women were illiterate. And it seemed to me that if you had power, you were, able, you were educated, you had words, you could write, you could read. And for me, books changed my life completely. They were the magic in my life. So, you know, I do think they're the most powerful magic. What is their fascination with fairy tales, for instance? And I can just tell in my heart, you read those fairy tales when you were a kid. I did. You know, that for me, those were the stories that I loved as a kid. And I think one of the reasons I loved them was because 
I, I still feel this, that fairy tales have an emotional truth that a lot of other literature doesn't have, especially for children. And when you're a child and you read fairy tales, even though they're sometimes brutal and difficult, you can feel that emotionally they're true. And all, the other thing about fairy tales, which is really interesting is, I forget the exact percentage, but something like 85% of the heroes in fairy tales are girls. And so for me, that as a child reader, that was really very attractive. And I think what you read as a child really impacts what you write uh, as a writer. That's the first time I've ever heard that, but I love that. 85% were, up, were, hero, were the girls were the heroes in 85%. You talked about research there. You had to have done research here. And I'm talking about on magic spells. So where does somebody go to research magic spells? <laughs> well, I happen to have a huge magic library and I've been collecting books for more than 25 years and some books that are very difficult to find um, and books about herbal magic, books about spells. I have books about magic from England and from France. And so, you know, I read through them. I do do a lot of research and everything in the books I have to do with, you know, magic that has been used, whether effectively or not, I can't promise, but, um, and I, I, I don't recommend using any of it. But I think there's a lot of um, witchcraft and, and nature kind of go together. And the whole sense of herbal curing and, and healing is very important in that tradition. And I am assuming, you said you had a big collection. I'm assuming that every culture has its, its own history of magic. This, we, we are talking about what happened in mostly in, in this country, but also in, in England and other places. But it is a cultural thing, is it not? It's definitely a cultural thing. And I, every time I do research, I'm so surprised to find magic in so many places. When I wrote The Dove Keepers, which takes place in ancient Judea, I mean, I was just shocked about how much magic was used and how magic and religion and medicine are all interwoven in so many different cultures. I was hoping, Alice, you had a little magic shop somewhere in your house because I was going to put it in order for at least the, the black soap and the courage tea. And, and you really, I, I think I, the formulas are pretty much in there. I could do that. I could go far with those two things alone. They are. And you know, one thing that I thought was so interesting when I was writing this book, it was pre-COVID, but one of the things that um, women who were healers were more successful than the physicians of the time was because they washed their hands, usually with soap that was somewhat antibacterial because of the ingredients. Amazing. There is a connection, at least I found the connection between one of my favorites, The Marriage of Opposites, which I, I spoke about in, in the open, and this book, Magic Lessons. And it has to do really with the tropics, St. Thomas, Curacao, and to me, what was a little known history, yes, the Jews were fleeing their countries for the tropics, but you have a couple in this book, and it's a father and son, Samuel and Abraham Diaz, who are fictional, but they are also pirates. They're Jewish. And tell me about what, where did the pirates come from? You had this obviously showed up in research as well. Yeah, I was also really shocked about that because, well, Jews were really um, exiles and exiled from pretty much every country in Europe. And so that they took to the sea. Yeah, they went to the islands, but they also lived at sea a lot. And I was shocked to see and to find out how many pirates, also navigators and explorers, were Jewish. And many of them did wind up in, in, in the West Indies, but you know, one of the things that's true is that they, they were at sea because there was no place, no land that would take them. Such, such an interesting part of that book. I'm going to remind people for, if you have questions, put them in our Facebook chat. And we do have a question, if I can get to that. It's Mario says, if you could become another character from the Owens family. Uh, oh, that's interesting. Who would you choose and why? You know, it's so interesting because I ask my readers that sometimes, you know, what, who was your favorite character? Who do you want to read more about? I mean, I, for me, I very much related to Maria. 
I very much identified with her. She is somebody that I wished I were more like. She's very, you know, she's very independent. She makes her way through the world by herself. She's pretty fearless. And um, so for me, I, I, I guess it would be Maria Owens. We have another question from Sherry Thomas, and this is really good, Sherry. Uh, did your research lend you to uh, believe in magic? You know, I do. I'm willing to believe in anything. And I feel like for me, it was funny because I grew up on Long Island, which is, I guess, for some people, a very unmagical place. But for me, it was always a very magical place. And, you know, fireflies, the library. I mean, for me, when I look back at my childhood, for me, it was a very magical place. So do I believe in magic? Yeah, sure. But I actually believe that for me, you know, I think literature for me has been the magic that really changed my life. I love that you equate the fireflies in the library with magic. I mean, that that's special. The book to me is a relationship book. We have mothers and daughters and friends and some of them are honoring and protecting. Others are hurting and betraying. There are women who are rule breakers. But what's interesting is that this book is in the 1600s, yet there are messages that jumped right out at me that are just as valid for girls and for women today. Can we spend a little time on that? Yeah, I completely agree with you. And I was kind of surprised because when I was researching kind of Puritan beliefs, I really felt very modern in terms of um, what's happening for us politically right now. I mean, the Puritans came to this country for religious freedom and then proceeded to persecute everyone who didn't believe what they believed in. And they had very strict attitudes and very strict attitudes about women. For them, women were the root of all evil and women were the originators of sin, just as Eve was the originator of sin and women were not taught to read. Um, you know, the head of the household was everything and that was the man of the house. If you were a woman without a man, you were really looked down on. And, you know, I was just, it really did feel like it had an echo, a modern echo to me of what could happen, what may be happening um, now. There is this sense of place that you are so masterful at. And in this particular book, there's more than one place, but there is a stark contrast from country to country, even from city to city. And when we get to 17th century Massachusetts, boy, did that pop off the pages because as you just mentioned, the Puritans, the women yeah. in this time, what a terrible existence. How, let, let's terrible. get into that, how they looked, how they dressed, what they could and couldn't do. Yeah, if you wore silk, a silk bonnet, you were arrested. I mean, there, it was very, uh, very um, straight uh, rules for women. And, you know, one of the things that really kind of shocked me was that um, it just, it was so different in Massachusetts than in other places. It really was very regional, the belief systems. For instance, in New York in the 17th century, there were no witchcraft trials. There were two but they, the witches were cleared and the people involved were all from New England. So Manhattan had different religions, was very tolerant, had a lot of immigrants and Massachusetts was very, had kind of a darker um, tone to it, not accepting. That's such a contrast when you look at the actual, how the distance between New York City and Salem is not that far and it was a world apart. We had we they had the Salem had witch trials. There was mass yeah. hysteria, public hangings at that time. I mean, incredible. Yeah. The, the men in power were very prominent people, including um, a historical character, John Hawthorne, who was the great great grandfather of the author Nathaniel Hawthorne, who wrote the Scarlet Letter, and um, he is he's a character in the book, but he was also a historical character and a horrible, uh, cruel judge who never apologized for what he did. Was he as horrible in real life as he was uh, in, in the book? Because he was despicable in this book. Oh, I think, he was, I think he was worse, you know? And I think the Scarlet Letter itself is kind of an apology because it's a book about, it's, it's a lot like my book. I think my book is modeled on it because it's about a, 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 an unwed um, 
woman who has a child who um, is ostracized and lives in the woods. And, you know, it's just not, it was a difficult place to, to be a woman. I had wondered about the connection between the judge, John Hawthorne, and Nathaniel Hawthorne. It's a, there's a difference in the spelling, I think, of the names. And some people think it was because he didn't want to be related to this John Hawthorne. And some people say he just, it was easier for him to, to spell it the way he did. But yeah, they spelled their names differently. As a writer, when you are integrating a real person, John Hawthorne, the, the judge we were talking about, into a book of fiction, how do you do that seamlessly so that he, it, it all seems so real? Is that, is it tricky to do that? Well, you know, I do a lot of research, but at some point as a novelist, I really have to be telling a story. I mean, I can't research for the rest of my life and I'm not writing nonfiction. I want everything in the book uh, to be true, that's there, to be real, to be true. But I also feel like there are certain things that people don't know about him. They don't know what he thought. They don't know what his private life was like. We can't really know certain things about him. So I feel free to invent those particular things. And I, I love how that's done. The, um, there's something else. And I know you're going to think I'm probably crazy talking about this, but it's the crow. And uh -huh. I, it, this crow is so important to the story. I never spoil stories. So I'm going to kind of talk around it. But for one, I am so fascinated by their intelligence. And I have read things how unbelievably brilliant they are. You have a couple, you have a couple of reference in here. And I don't know if these are true or if it just made for a good story. But one was when a crow dies, the others band together to search for those responsible. It's called mobbing, mobbing. And they use tools and they, you know, they have a very high intelligence. And um, in my book, this crow is a, considered a familiar. And wh what a familiar is, you know, was said to be a witch's animal partner or, or an animal that a witch is very empathic with and very involved with. A familiar, I am hoping that wouldn't it be nice if we could all have a familiar in our lifetime? I mean, some one yeah. special animal, it would be an incredible. There was another thing about the crows in the book that you said their minds never rest. There was a chapter that you pretty much put a knife into my heart. So thank you for that. Well, can we just <laughs> say that the Owens women have a difficult time with love? Yes. I mean, I think we can say that they're cursed, which they are. Okay. And they are cursed. They're cursed. They are cursed. And, you know, I think a lot of people do feel cursed in love, so they're not alone in, in, in this situation. Does it make it more interesting as the author because the women are cursed, because they're flawed? Yeah, I think it does. I mean, I think, I think love is very complicated and it's very complicated in this book. And, um, you know, I think sometimes you can curse yourself. You can, you can react to certain traumatic situations and make it worse. And that's what, that's what happens really with Maria. And, um, you know, but, but it, it's said in the book that what, what's done can be undone. So hopefully, even if you're cursed, you can somehow figure out a way to undo that curse. We do have a question if um, I would love to take this one and it's talking about, this is from Mario. What was the main thing that made you want to write about witches? I recently found this drawing that I had done in third grade with a witch, a drawing of a witch. So I feel like I have been writing about witches in one way or another since third grade. And you know, partially that's because of what I read as a kid. And also, I always feel that the witch is the only female mythic figure that has power. And that really appealed to me as a story, as a reader and also as a storyteller. That's interesting. This book, Magic Lessons, lends itself to the big screen. Dare I ask, will there be another movie? Well, you know, uh, my friend Deason Denise Denovi, she was the producer of Practical Magic, and she is hopefully bringing all the books um, 
to TV in a series. So um, she's been working on that for a while. Oh, I will be binging then, you, you know, for sure. <laughs> we have another question from a new writer. And I know that this is, this can be a tough business. Any advice yeah. for those of us who keep putting it off? Um, Ghostwriters, for instance, or how, what do you do? How do you, how do you get started? Well, you know, it really depends. I'm a big believer in taking writing courses and finding a writing group and getting together with other writers. I, you know, I had a great teacher, so I feel like it's, it's great to take classes if you're, you know, really beginning. And then after that, to kind of maybe form your own group with other writers. Um, for me, that's, that's always the best way to begin. But really, if you want to be a writer, the most important thing to do is to write. And so I think it's really important to get up every day and write. And it, the more you write, the more you will find, you, the easier it is. If you, if you just keep putting it off, I think it gets harder and harder. Is that what you do? Do you have a dedicated practice of every single day uh, for a, a certain amount of hours? Or how does that work? I, I, really try, I really try to do that because I, I find that the flow is much easier if you do that every day. And for me, I, I try to get up early and do it before the rest of the world is awake and you're getting phone calls and emails and all those sort of things. So for me, it works to do it early in the day. Are you finding your creativity to be enhanced or to be stifled being at home so much now? You know, it's funny. That's a great question, but I, I think it's both. I mean, I've been writing much more because I'm not traveling. I'm not going to places that I used to go to. I have more time at home, but I also have a certain anxiety level. So, um, you know, on one hand, writing is an escape for me from the real world. So I think, you know, I think I've probably been writing more during this time period. Alice, I have another question, and I love this because I would be right on board. Have you ever thought about putting together a book with all of the recipes and the that that we see in this book? And um, wow, wouldn't that be interesting? Well, you know, it's funny. That's a great question. Um, it's funny because I'm just I make up little books for readers as gifts um, that I give away, and we just did the Owens Family Cookbook. And I realized how much food is are is in my books and how many, many recipes. Um, so yeah, I definitely think that would be a fun thing to do. And it would also be fun to do a grimoire. The um, grimoire is kind of the magical, it's kind of like a magical diary. It's where a witch would put all of her spells, all of her herbal mixtures. And I, I think that might be really fun to do. I think that would be terrific. And when you, you talked before about witchcraft and nature, you know, being t together. Yeah, all, I see all the, the Owens girls with all of the things that they've grown or foraged and um, turned into all kinds of fantastic spells and recipes. There's also just like a lot of regular food in the books, I realized, you know, they, they you know, they have this cake called chocolate tipsy cake, which is in every book that that cake is there, that chocolate cake is there. Got to do it. We could all use a little more magic in our world today. Do you think there is perhaps a magic lesson that you wish we could all understand now? Well, I think, you know, magic lessons is really about being exiled, being an immigrant, be, not being accepted into society, um, being a woman who's looked down upon and who has to fight for her independence. So I think these are all lessons that we all are dealing with right now. In the book, Maria says what you put out into the world comes back threefold. So let's take that to heart. The book is Magic Lessons. Alice Hoffman, I cannot thank you enough for this today. What a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm Ann Bocock. Please connect with me and join me on the next Between the Covers. <laughs>